Okay. We're very pleased that you joined us today as we meet with Professor Eitan Okun, an eminent neurobiologist at Barilan University. His cutting edge work on a vaccine for Alzheimer's disease is receiving much well-deserved attention and we're all looking forward to hearing from him. But before we do, just a word about Barilan University, our remarkable institution. Award-winning campus, our researchers are setting milestone achievements in the sciences as well as in the humanities. And in the beautiful environment in which Barilan has, it's infused with Jewish values and a love for the state of Israel. And in that environment, we provide students with a top level education in undergrad and graduate studies and a whole array of certification and outreach programs that make an impact on all sectors of Israeli society. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Steve Bedder and his wife, Esther, guiding lights in Los Angeles. Steve is president and managing partner of Triumph Properties Group, a leading real estate investment development and management company in the Los Angeles area. Steve's parents, Margaret and Paul Fedder of blessed memory, were well-loved leaders of the, of the Los Angeles Jewish community and longtime friends of Barilan University and so many other causes related to the community, including Jewish education and Holocaust memorials in both Los Angeles and in Israel. After her beloved husband's passing, Margaret dedicated the Paul Feder Alzheimer's Research Lab at Barilan University, directed by faculty member Eitan Upun. Margaret's generosity has provided support for the vital research that Professor Okun is conducted. We're delighted that Steve is, has agreed to join us as host for this event and to speak a few words about his late parents and to introduce Professor Okun, I give you Steve Feder. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Karen. Um, it is truly an honor for me to be here today, not only to acknowledge the work of Professor Oaken, who's so committed to finding a cure for the dreaded disease that affects so many families, but also to recognize my dear parents, Holocaust survivors who built new lives in Los Angeles. My father was a successful businessman and Talmudic scholar um, who had fought every um, adversary adversary before he was finally defeated by Alzheimer's disease. He, he was truly, his, his mind was everything. He read consistently and to see him limited by what Alzheimer's and dementia does was beyond, beyond. And I'm sure a number of people on this, on this webinar have experienced the same thing. Um, it, is, it is truly uh, horrific. Um, my mother was devoted to making my, mother, my father's life one of great dignity and comfort. After his passing, she dedicated herself to search of finding answers uh, to the harrowing questions. Um, and that's when we met Professor Eitan Oken. Professor Eitan Oken is a highly respected neurobiologist. Most importantly, he is one, a man of humility and a true mensch. And it has been an absolute privilege for us to be associated with him beyond, of course, his absolute unbelievable mind. His current research projects include the development of what would be a truly life-changing innovation, a vaccine. We've heard a lot about vaccines recently against Alzheimer's disease. After receiving his PhD from Bar Ilan University in 2006, Professor Okun uh, obtained his postdoctoral training at the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Aging. In 2011, he joined the Mina and Everett Good Goodman Faculty of Life Sciences at Bar Ilan. His cutting edge research is performed at the Pauli Federer Alzheimer's Research Laboratory. Dr. Oken and his research team are also investigating the causes of various disorders, including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and Huntington's disease, as well as ischemic brain stroke. Um, I know that also Eitan 
on a personal level has experienced exactly what this is all about, um, unfortunately, as well. Um, we will have time for some questions at the end of the program. Please type your questions into the Zoom chat and Professor Oaken will address them at the end of the presentation. It gives me great pleasure to present to Pre Professor Aitano. Thank you very much, Steve, for the uh, warm introduction. Um, I'm, uh, I feel privileged to conduct the research that I'm about to show um, uh, with the support of the Federal family. And with that, uh, I will uh, begin my uh, presentation. So I'm just sharing my screen right now. Okay. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, the topic of, uh, of uh, today's talk will be Alzheimer's disease, and I will uh, begin with uh, addressing why Alzheimer's disease is so prevalent in the uh, 20th and 21st uh, centuries. And towards the second half of the talk, I will uh, describe novel discoveries that we've done in the lab in the last uh, year, which is the cumulative uh, effort of, uh, of uh, multiple students in the lab in the past uh, four years. And so um, what, the, what the lab uh, actually studies is uh, ways to delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease using vaccines, as uh, Steve mentioned, uh, as well as to prevent Alzheimer's disease-related dementia in Down syndrome, which is a, a pathology that is related to Alzheimer's disease and through which we can study about Alzheimer's disease. And lastly, we study the role of immune cells in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that's a, a novel function we found to the immune system uh, in progressing Alzheimer's disease, and we'll see how we can manipulate it to ameliorate uh, the pathology. So why is Alzheimer's disease uh, so prevalent? Um, so we have three main uh, contributing factors. One is the increase in longevity. The second is a decrease in total physical activity that people nowadays um, exhibit and also increased food consumption. And so these three things may not necessarily uh, seem related to Alzheimer's disease, but I will try to convince you that it is. Um, and here goes. So, you know, if we look at, for example, um, the demography worldwide, we can see that in the, in the 1950s, this was the distribution of the, the population in the world. What you can see above the dotted line is um, the number of uh, individuals above the age of 65, uh, the pension age. And you can see that uh, if we extrapolate to um, uh, 20 years from now, we can see that the total number of people in the world that are so-called in the third age or above the age of uh, 65 increases dr dramatically. And why is that important? It's important because uh, we know that since the 19th uh, century, the lifespan increases linearly. And right now we're uh, getting close to a, a situation in which the uh, lifespan uh, reaches the age of 95, which is good on one hand. However, it comes uh, with the price uh, in which the life quality towards the last uh, decades of uh, our life is not as good as it uh, as previous decades. And this is mostly due to the fact that since the age of 60, every five years we can see a doubling of the number of, of uh, individuals that uh, experience dementia, such that in the age of 85, uh, one third of the individuals exhibit dementia. So these are really large numbers considering that the A, the, the lifespan increases worldwide as well as the number of population. And the most prevalent dementia related pathology in the brain of uh, these individuals is Alzheimer's disease. It occupies more than 60% of uh, all uh, dementia types. And, and, and this is a, 
this bears a very significant um, health-related um, implications, economic implications, as well as social implications. So a little bit of background about Alzheimer's. Um, so the majority of cases of Alzheimer's disease in the general population occur in the age of 70 and onwards. Uh, a small fraction of the individuals with Alzheimer's will exhibit the disease at an earlier age of 50, 55. And there is another third population that exhibits Alzheimer's disease and that's individuals with Down syndrome. Down syndrome is the most prevalent uh, intellectual disability and it's a, uh, it occurs in one in every 500 pregnancies, which is important for um, one of the uh, sections of the novel findings that I will describe uh, in the second part of the talk. And so the importance of uh, studying this uh, uh, population is that uh, these individuals have Alzheimer's related dementia at a very young age of 40. And since individuals with Down syndrome can be diagnosed as early as in utero, during pregnancy that is, uh, we can direct a therapy or a, a therapy that we think can help against Alzheimer's related dementia and pretty quickly to see in this population, in these individuals, whether it's beneficial. And then we can extrapolate it uh, or generalize it to the general population. So this is uh, some of the rationale to uh, study this uh, group of individuals. So what happens in the brain when uh, individuals experience Alzheimer's disease. So here you can see a human brain uh, and uh, in which the disease progresses from stage one, two and on. And two types of proteins in the brain, you can see it, uh, a depiction of it here and here. The proteins are called amyloid beta and tau. These are the two you know, hallmarks of the disease. These two kinds of proteins start to propagate in the brain. As you can see, this is a gradual increasing uh, process, both for this type of protein and the amyloid beta protein, as well as for tau. You can see that the protein spreads in the brain towards the uh, last and severe stages of the disease. But the important thing that you should know is that this process begins 20 years before the onset of the disease. So under the hood, this kind of accumulation of proteins in the brain, so wh what you actually see here is what, what we see when we uh, analyze the brain after death, and we can see this accumulation of proteins in the brain, that's abnormal protein accumulation. And the important thing is that this process of accumulation of proteins in the brain occurs 20 years before disease onset. And this gives us a lot of time to intervene with a therapies that we develop in order to delay the onset of the disease. And this is key to finding a future therapy for Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so we know that longevity is a critical factor for Alzheimer's disease. For a long time, we've known that um, age is the most important or critical risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. However, what about physical activity? Um, we know that physical activity results in the production of pro-survival factors for neurons in our brain. And that these pro-survival factors, amongst many other things, promote the formation of new neurons in the brain. We can actually see that in a part of the brain that is important for learning and memory. So for example, while you listen to this talk and you try to memorize um, things that I mentioned, um, this brain region is uh, actually functioning at a greater pace in your brain right now. As you can see, um, if we label newly formed neurons in this particular brain region in orange, as you can see here, we can see that in animals that are not physically active, there is a given number of, uh, of these uh, newly formed cells. However, in animals that we um, enable them to run um, more frequently, we can see that there is an, a faster production of these 
uh, young neurons. So these animals actually have more neurons, more younger neurons in their brain, and specifically in an area that is responsible for memorizing facts. So that's uh, uh, one of the effects of physical activity. Another critical effect of physical activity is promoting the formation of blood vessels by releasing blood vessel factors. So uh, you, can you can see in the illustration, um, if an animal is uh, uh, occupied in, uh, in being physically active, you can see a significant formation of blood vessels in their brain. And that's important for um, preventing the loss of neurons throughout aging. It is also important for preventing stroke or brain stroke, which is amongst the most significant contributors to morbidity and mortality in old age. And now I want to show you uh, a short movie in which we um, zoom in to that very same brain region I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's actually called the hippocampus. And it's the brain region which is the most critical for our ability to conduct uh, learning and memorize new facts. So this is the brain of our um, uh, most used uh, animal model to study uh, pathologies of the brain. And now we zoom in into that very interesting brain region that is critical for learning, learning and memory, and that's the hippocampus. And within that region, we can see this beautiful, uh, you know, banana-shaped uh, brain region or subregion called the dente gyrus. We will soon zoom into it. The, the reason that you see this beautiful structure is that because it is uh, the way that the neurons are um, localized in that brain region. And now we, as we zoom into this brain region, we will start to see electrical activity. I'm sure that you can already see it. Um, you can see this brain activity, electrical activity that goes in one direction. It starts with one area of the neuron, it gets to the uh, cell body and then goes on to the next, um, to the next uh, region of the brain. This is what happens in your brain right now. And now as we focus on a single neuron amongst all these neurons in the hippocampus, we will now focus on the most important um, structure of the, of the human neuron and it's called the dendritic spine. You will see the, do you see these, you know, small protrusions? We will start to focus on this, on one of these um, protrusions. And what you need to know about that is that this is the most important structure in the neuron that enables us to memorize facts. Um, for example, uh, if this neuron transmits an electrical activity because we, for example, saw something or heard something or learned something, the second neuron, the purple neuron, forms a synapse, a connection with this particular uh, neuron. And this enables now the transfer of memory and formation of memory, of new memory. Um, this is what happens as we learn. And this, is, this process is further strengthened when we exercise, okay? So physical activity results in the formation of new neurons, new blood vessels, and eventually promote learning and memory. So uh, we acknowledge that a decrease in the physical activity throughout the, the, the last uh, uh, century, as we become more sedentary, less active, um, it's a contributing factor for uh, reducing our cognitive capacity. However, what's about food, right? It, it may seem uh, counterintuitive. However, this is the case for it. Um, as our cells, and this is just a representation of one of our cells in the body, are uh, exposed to food, then it gives the cell a cue to grow, to make more cells, that is to proliferate. And to do that, the cell needs to make proteins. However, or in contrast, when we are uh, 
experiencing, experiencing fasting, that is that uh, we are devoid of food nutrients, we become or the cells become more energy efficient and become better at eliminating damaged proteins. Now, key to understanding why that this is important is the slide I showed you earlier in which throughout aging and especially in Alzheimer's, we have accumulation of damaged proteins. Okay, so let's see how this converge now. Um, so again, when we, have, uh, when we when the cells grow and make proteins, they need to make proteins in order to make new cells and let the cells grow. Then this in fact uh, activates the protein synthesis machinery in each and every one of our cells in the body. Okay, the protein synthesis machinery. In contrast, when we have the situation in which we are devoid of uh, nutrients, we are, or the cells eliminate damaged proteins. And this is, or this can be done through the activation of protein recycling machinery. So on one hand, when we grow and we are exposed to food, we have the protein synthesis machinery. And when we don't have the nutrients, we have the protein recycling machinery. Okay, so, you may ask, okay, so what's the big deal? We need both of these uh, systems. However, reality is that whenever the protein synthesis machinery operates, the protein recycling machinery is inhibited. So both of these systems cannot work jointly. Whenever one is functioning, the other one is uh, inhibited. And why that is important? That is important, again, because we know nowadays that um, in order to induce Alzheimer's disease or during Alzheimer's disease, there is this, rap not a rapid, but a significant accumulation of abnormal proteins in the brain. I showed you that it is progressively expands in the brain. And this is the result of uh, the cell's inability to get rid of abnormal proteins to the extent that they just build up in the brain. And the system that is responsible for uh, preventing this kind of accumulation is the protein recycling machinery, okay? If the protein recycling machinery doesn't work, then there is cell death. So this accumulation of proteins results in cell death. And this is exactly why we need um, throughout our life as a lifestyle change to induce the protein recycling machinery and this can be done through fasting. Uh, and from here, there is this uh, recently or relatively recently described concept of intermittent fasting in which uh, throughout at least 16 hours of the day, um, an organism or a person needs to fast um, and through in the remaining eight hours to eat. Why? Because in these 16 hours of fasting, the activation of the protein recycling machinery is enabled. And in the remaining eight hours, uh, with the introduction of nutrients, the pro protein synthesis machinery can be reactivated. And so if we look at the, at the last uh, 100 years or so, uh, I, should, I should say uh, uh, since following the Second World War, uh, we can see an increase in life expectancy at birth, which leads to the uh, fact that there are more people that are old age. And this results in the accumulation of damaged protein in their brain. In parallel, we can see an increase in food availability worldwide, or at least in the, in the Western world. Uh, this resulted in an elevation in food consumption, um, which was coupled with continuous food intake. You know, we, we constantly are a, a, you know, exposed to food. Food is not really limited in, in major parts of the Western world, um, as well as there is an increase in the variety of food uh, products. This le leads to a decrease in the protein recycling machinery in each and every one of the cells of our body and especially in our brain. And the combination of accumulation of damaged proteins and reduction in protein recycling machinery leads to an increase in the prevalence 
of neurodegeneration. And therefore, uh, towards the, uh, throughout the 21st century, in order to delay neurodegeneration, what we can already do in absence of an effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease in general, and also other neurodegenerative diseases, in order to support longevity, we need to increase our physical activity and limit our food consumption. So, so far I showed you what uh, are the factors or the major factors that contribute to dementias and Alzheimer's dementia in particular, um, and what can and should be done in order to delay neurodegeneration until we will have um, you know, effective treatments. So now in the second part of the talk, I would like to discuss what's exciting in the lab, what are the novel um, uh, discoveries that we've made in the lab, uh, especially in the last year, which is the uh, a culmination of, of significant efforts in the past four years. And I would like to mention um, two uh, main findings out of uh, three recent findings that we have done. And I will begin with the first one. Uh, can mothers help protect their children from Alzheimer's disease? And so the concept of this uh, uh, discovery is that um, we can actually engage in maternal vaccination treatment. So one of the themes in our lab is vaccination. And we have previously shown that uh, adult uh, uh, animals that uh, exhibit uh, Alzheimer's disease can be vaccinated to ameliorate uh, the pathology. However, now I'm addressing what can mothers do to their, for their children. Um, and so um, in this paradigm, we can take healthy mothers, and I'm reminding you again, our animal model is the, the mouse. And so we can vaccinate these healthy, healthy mothers against uh, one of the proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease. Again, its name is amyloid beta. So now these female mice uh, have a lot of antibodies in their body. And I, you know, I'm, I, I'm happy to use the, the term antibodies. I think that everybody by now know what antibodies are thanks to the corona. Um, a crisis um, in which people are more informed to what they, how the immune system functions. And now these females, now that they generate uh, high levels of antibodies against this particular protein, which was used to vaccinate, they are uh, mated with male mice that carry the genetic cause for Alzheimer's disease. And as a result, we have offspring in which 50% of them will carry the disease, okay? Because only one of the parents carry, carry the gene for the disease. And what we observed is that the vaccinated mothers actually deliver protective antibodies to the embryos during pregnancy. We can actually measure the level of antibodies um, both in the mother as well as in the uh, embryo. Okay, but not only that, we also saw that the mothers deliver protective antibodies to the offspring via uh, the milk, via lactation. We can actually also measure that. And importantly, we showed, or we were able to show that offspring to mothers that delivered protective antibodies to, to them, when they were adults, their cognitive capacity was much more improved compared to offspring that were not uh, receiving antibodies or protective antibodies from the mothers. So our vision uh, for the, with this approach is a, a maternal vaccination with, which can induce long-term protection to the offspring against cog cognitive decline, okay? And, and this bears implication for um, a, a situation in which Alzheimer's disease is induced by genetic factors, uh, which we can track and protect against um, during a pregnancy and following it using lactation. Uh, a second very exciting um, a finding that we are uh, currently revealing in our lab is related to why 
more women have Alzheimer's disease compared to men. So I'm not sure if you are aware of that, but uh, throughout the world, uh, the number of women that exhibit Alzheimer's disease is double than that of men. And it is not a matter of the fact that uh, in some countries, uh, women have a longer lifespan compared to men, but it is prevalent or persistent throughout the different ages. So more women have Alzheimer's. And so far we knew of several genetic factors that were responsible for that. However, uh, there is also a finding that mothers to individuals or mothers to uh, children of, uh, that have Down syndrome has five fold higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. And this was curious to us because it enabled us to start deciphering why women have a higher prevalence for Alzheimer's disease. In fact, uh, studies show that uh, here you can see in this graph that women that were pregnant with the Down syndrome have a much higher risk for Alzheimer's disease uh, compared to women that did not have um, offspring with Down syndrome. And so we began studying this in the lab and we were, uh, we were able to see that the more uh, exposure um, mothers had to Down syndrome offspring, the lower their memory abilities were. Okay, so something um, in the fact that uh, the mother carried a Down syndrome offspring or embryo caused a, a reduction in the cognitive capacity of the mother, which in humans can be translated to uh, Alzheimer's disease and hence uh, possibly contributing to why women have more Alzheimer's disease than men. Uh, generally speaking, nowadays there is an increased understanding for the fact that um, many diseases have different, con different uh, uh, factors contributing in men and women. And therefore, it is also important to study in Alzheimer's. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we know it's a generally understood concept that uh, mothers deliver factors. I showed you previously antibodies, but mothers deliver many types of uh, factors to the offspring in order to support its growth, etc. However, what we found was that the offspring also transfers factors back to the mother. So there is this uh, mutual uh, discussion or bidirectional discussion um, uh, between these two entities, the mother and the offspring, which potentially affect um, both of their um, uh, physiology and disease. In fact, what we saw that uh, in the mother's body and specifically in the mother's uh, brain, we can see cells that originate in the fetus. For example, here you can see a cell, okay? It's a, it's a round cell in which you can find both X chromosomes, which can be found in both males and females, but we can also see Y chromosome, which indicates to us that this particular cell originated in a male offspring during pregnancy of that mother. Okay, think about it. We can actually find or trace cells that originate in the fetus and uh, travel all the way into the mother's brain where they reside for a, a very long time. So in a way, this, this, is, this is so interesting to imagine, but in a way, a mother following its pregnancy, it's a chimeric uh, uh, organism with some cells of its offspring. And this is amazing, an amazing concept. And so what we currently study is uh, what are the factors that are traveling uh, between the fetus, okay, as you can see here depicted, and the mother. So we study both whether it is whole cells, as I showed you earlier, but we also study whether it's particular proteins that are transferred between the embryos and the mother, 
okay? In fact, uh, we are developing or we are currently developing a vaccine to prevent the transfer of these proteins from the embryos into the mother in order to prevent the memory decline that I showed you earlier that occurs in mothers um, that were exposed to uh, embryos carrying the uh, genetic cause for Alzheimer's, okay? So um, what we are doing is we are vaccinating female mice against these factors that are transferred from the fetus. We then make them with males that carry the, the gene that causes the disease. Okay, and we can, we can show, and we already showed that this vaccine results in a decrease in the production or in the presence of uh, disease-causing proteins in the mother's brain. Um, and uh, now we are uh, occupied with uh, assessing how uh, significant this effect is on the cognitive capacity of the mothers. Okay, and this is all as part of, a, of an effort to uh, uh, patent this uh, vaccine and be able to, uh, with it, make an impact in the clinic. And so this concept is very clinically relevant and important uh, as a maternal vac vaccination for long-term protection, this time of the mother against cognitive decline. So what we think is that in addition to known genetic factors that contribute to um, why women have a higher proportion of uh, Alzheimer's disease in the population compared to men, uh, we also uh, think that um, the very pregnancy with uh, uh, offspring that have genetic factors um, can cause Alzheimer's in women. And we can actually, and we are actually developing a vaccine to prevent this cognitive decline. So this is a very um, a important concept for us. It's a, it's a revolution with respect to our perspective. And it's a, it's a very interesting uh, project that we are uh, doing in the lab. Uh, lastly, um, the last uh, um, topic or project that I will mention, but we will not delve into because of a uh, lack of time, uh, is, the, is targeting immune cells in order to fight Alzheimer's disease. So uh, we are getting increasingly um, aware that the immune system has an important, perhaps even critical role in inducing and progressing uh, of or in induction and progression of Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, we were able to show that uh, inhibiting a specific type of immune cells uh, in the body can prevent the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Which cells these are? These are actually the same cells that induce antibodies um, in our body. These cells, uh, if you're interested, they're called B cells uh, or plasma cells. Uh, and these are actually the same cells that induce antibodies following vaccination, example for, uh, for the corona. Um, in general, the concept of the interaction between the immune system and the nervous system is, is, is fascinating. And recent data show that actually vaccinating against the influenza or pneumonia can affect uh, the um, susceptibility to Alzheimer's disease in the elderly. So many, uh, many interesting um, discoveries are going to come from this type of neuroimmune interactions. However, I, I, it's beyond the scope of our talk and hopefully I can speak with you about it in the future. So with that, I would like uh, to conclude. I want to thank uh, the lab members, uh, especially Tomer, uh, Ravit, uh, Khalil and uh, Tamir, uh, Ranin, Ido and Kuldeep uh, for um, contributing to the works that I mentioned here in this talk. And I would like to thank you for uh, listening and I will be happy to uh, have questions now. Thank you. Uh,
First of all, I'd like to thank you very much, Eitan. That was an absolutely fascinating insight into a disease that we know so little about, but fear so greatly. And I think that you've given a wonderful perspective about it. Um, we're looking forward to hearing some questions from our audience. I'm sure you have very many. And um, Eitan will answer in as much time as, uh, as he has and we have. So thank you very much. Eitan, again, for Steve Fedder, uh, who I think has had to leave, for Esther, and for everybody, all our partners and our friends who joined this uh, Zoom presentation this morning. Okay, so again, <laughs> thank you everyone for, uh, for uh, listening. Uh, I will now go through the chat uh, to see or to look for questions that uh, um, that people asked uh, during my talk. Um, so one question is, uh, does hyperbaric oxygen treatment help uh, prevent further progression of Alzheimer's disease or help to reduce the effects? So in fact, um, there is uh, evidence from both humans as well as uh, animal studies that uh, show that hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, can uh, delay the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Um, what is the mechanism for that? Uh, that that's kind of important. Uh, people think that uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, induces the formation of uh, more blood vessels. And um, this, uh, as I showed you earlier, uh, helps delay the uh, brain damage. And so certainly hyperbaric oxygen therapy is uh, beneficial. I hope that more centers of hyperbaric oxygen therapy will be um, uh, built and that more research will be done in order to understand its mechanisms. Okay, so certainly. Uh, next question regarding fasting, uh, must it be 16 hours fasting or will 12 hours be enough? Uh, so research in animal models show that, it, that 16 hours are a, a, a necessary um, because the more hours uh, you fast, the more effective the mechanism of protein recycling. And so 12 hours is less efficient than 16 hours. And on that same note, 20 hours is better than 16. However, uh, it is not uh, uh, always humanly possible, let's say, for various reasons uh, to engage in that. Uh, however, you know, this is what science tells us. Uh, so not always, um, we're not always happy with what science has to tell us, but maybe this is one of those times, but, uh, but you know, that's the fact. Um, let's see. Will a possible anti-Alzheimer's vaccine work as it as is to other forms of dementia or will other you know, need to be tailored? tailored? Um, any kind of a vaccine for Alzheimer's uh, will be specific for, um, uh, well, you know, it's actually depending on what the vaccine targets. So I mentioned amyloid beta and tau is two contributing protein factors to a pathology of Alzheimer's. Um, you should know that tau, for example, is a common denominator of a family of diseases called tauopathies, okay? Also amyloid beta is a common denominator of several amyloid related pathologies. So it is possible that uh, a specific vaccine will be beneficial for more than Alzheimer's disease. But if you're asking me, will in order to truly uh, ameliorate uh, neurodegenerative diseases, we'll probably need to combine a, a multiple uh, vaccines or multiple treatments that act in concert on different mechanisms. One of the reasons is that um, it is almost, um, it is kind of rare to see a clean Alzheimer's related pathology or a clean Parkinson's pathology or a clean Lewy body dementia pathology. It is often combined or overlapping with 
uh, additional dimensions, okay? So this, this is sort of an elaborate answer to, to this question. Um, yeah, there is a question, should we take the pneumonia vaccine? Um, preliminary evidence shown in the recent Alzheimer's Association conference, I believe it was in the US uh, during the corona uh, pandemic. So when I say it was in the US, it was a virtual meeting, okay? Uh, this preliminary data indicates that uh, people or elderly individuals should actually take the pneumonia vaccine. However, I need to tell you, this is a preliminary result and should be uh, followed up uh, significantly. Um, let me see. Can I talk more about uh, the link between flu vaccines and Alzheimer's? So it's pretty much the same answer. Uh, there is preliminary uh, indication that there is a link between the two. So individuals that were vaccinated against the flu or the pneumonia, and I, I refer to elderly individuals because uh, younger individuals do not need to be vaccinated against the, at least pneumonia. Um, so evidence or preliminary evidence indicates for a link between the two, but re more research needs to be done. But this is a fascinating um, topic. Uh, next. Are you strongly encouraging COVID-19 vaccination as an aid to reduce Alzheimer's? So there isn't uh, a data on this because you know, the, the COVID-19 vaccine was uh, just administered this year. In Israel, it's been more than 50% uh, uh, administration rate. Um, whereas in the US, I think it's a, it's a somewhat a lower uh, percentage. However, we will need to wait for several years in order to see whether there is a, a, an effect on dementia such as Alzheimer's. So right now it is too early to determine. Um, would an Alzheimer's vaccine be an injection or some other form of delivery? So uh, honestly, the, 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 the way of delivery or the means of delivery uh, isn't so uh, important in respect to a particular vaccine. So a vaccine can be administered either uh, via injection or um, uh, intranasally. Uh, however, um, it is uh, uh, in the end of the day, it shouldn't significantly interfere with the overall effect. Um, let's see. Given that amyloid beta is a naturally occurring protein in the brain, do you envision potential autoimmune problems as a result of vaccinating uh, patients and their children from amyloid beta accumulation? This is a, a terrific question. Um, so here is the thing. Uh, when, when the brain is intact, you know, it's physiologically intact, that is, there is no disease, there is no um, uh, Alzheimer's pathology in the brain, um, the rate of penetrance of antibodies into the brain is almost zero. When do we start to see penetrance of antibodies into the brain? It starts to occur when there is pathology, when there is Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's related dementia. Why is that? Because, you know, once there is this pathology, there is inflammation in the brain. And, you know, a, as part of this inflammation, there is a um, opening of the barrier between the blood and the brain. So uh, while it is very tightly closed in, in a healthy brain, in the diseased brain, it opens. And therefore, once the brain is diseased, um, there is uh, um, a, an ability for antibodies to penetrate the brain. Another thing is that in the healthy brain, there isn't an accumulation of these proteins outside of cells. So even if antibodies penetrate the brain, they will not find their targets, okay? So these are two distinctions that need to be made. Uh, is there a particular diet that helps delay brain damage? Uh, I mentioned one type of uh, diet 
that is the intermittent fasting. Um, there is another diet that is uh, sort of studied and that's the ketogenic diet. The rationale behind ket ketogenic diet, you may have heard about it. It's, it's a diet that uh, uh, promotes the ingestion of ketones, uh, which you know, can be given through fat, if you eat a lot of fat, uh, but can also be administered you know, therapeutically. Ketone bodies or ketones can replace or serve as an alternative to glucose uh, as, a, as an energetic metabolite for the brain. So uh, the rationale for that is that individuals with Alzheimer's disease have lower ability to utilize glucose and in order to activate the brain. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and in that case, if you supplement the brain with ketones, then you can bypass this inability to utilize glucose and still uh, enable the, the brain to function. So this is the, the rationale behind uh, ketones. Uh, one last thing about that is uh, lactate. Lactate is a metabolite that is uh, produced during exercise or during aerobic exercise. And lactate is also utilized by the brain, uh, more so than glucose and can help our brain activity. Uh, yeah, there is a question whether it is fasting every day. Um, generally, yeah, the more people will fast, um, the better it is for the functions of their brain. Uh, I just want to mention one caveat uh, to fasting, and that's a caveat for fasting in the elderly population. Uh, you, know, you should know that one of the most important factors for elderly individuals to increase their survivability at old age is, mass, is a, a muscle mass. So the more muscle mass, and I mean muscle mass, I don't mean uh, you know, fat mass, the more muscle mass you have, the better your chances to survive are as an elderly individual. So uh, what is the implication of this? The impl implication is that if you fast and you fast every day, you must include a, a, a significant portion of proteins in your diet in order to support yeah. your body muscle mass, okay? So this was kind of an extended answer to this question. Uh, let's see. Eitan, I think we'll, we'll maybe have one more. This has been so fascinating. This is Ron Solomon. Uh, we really just have to say at this point how lucky we are to have a researcher of the class of an Eitan Okun to be handling this part of our uh, uh, work in brain research and in Alzheimer's. And any of you who are in a position to be able to help with this research, to support this research, we would be deeply Deeply grateful. I think just the ability to say that I got in on the ground floor of such an incredible research project is an unbelievable Kiddush Hashem, a sanctification of God's name, if one person is, will be helped by this. So please think about it. Uh, I thank you all for tuning in. We wanted to keep it to an hour. We kept it to an hour. And Eitan, once again, please accept our deepest gratitude for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you so much. And if the, well, My pleasure. Know. Okay. If there was one more question, we can take that one more question. But well, I know the question was uh, yeah the question was whether fasting includes uh, water or some liquids and the answer is that uh, fasting is the um, avoiding food and uh, sugar so uh, any drink that doesn't have sugar or protein such as you know water or tea or coffee without uh, sugar or milk 
uh, is actually required. You must drink <laughs> during the day, um, but uh, without a sort of uh, energy related uh, sugar and protein. So that's it. Hey, Tom, we miss Ladies you. And gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for tuning in today. And I'd like to just give you a, a sneak peek of our next two webinars that we have coming up for AFBIU. On May 11th, we have a very special presentation with Senator Joe Lieberman and Rabbi Ari Khan of Bar Ilan University. They'll be talking about a book that they co-authored about the holiday of Shavuot. And on June the 9th, we will have Hadassah Lieberman, who will be speaking about her new memoir, Hadassah and American Life. And she will be interviewed on that. Uh, and so it will be a conversation followed by a chance to ask her some questions. So thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you, Professor Okun. And thank you all for uh, helping to support Bar Ilan University.